According to India's Juvenile Justice Act, a person under the age of 18 is viewed as a minor and is tried as such when they commit a crime. There is a difference between an adult and a minor in the eyes of the judiciary. After all, a child makes mistakes. They're children. That's what they do, one could argue. And what could a kid possibly do, right? Shoplift, rob, hit someone, kill a deer, or maybe ram into someone on the road and then run away. Often, that's the limit of a crime committed by a minor. And so the appropriate action is not to incarcerate them, but instead to rehabilitate them. But there are a few rare cases that blur the moral distinction between a child and an adult. A minor versus a mature person. A kid, as opposed to a killer. This is the story of one such case that redefined the phrase childish innocence. This is the story of 16-year-old Sajjal Baroi. Hi everyone, welcome to Desi Crime, a show where we dive deep into some of the craziest cases from around South Asia. I'm your host Aryan. And I'm Ishvara. And the story I have for you today comes from India's heart of literature and poetry, Kolkata. More than a hundred episodes done now, Aryan, yeah. and never a child killer, I think. Not mm. that there aren't cases, mm. but this is probably the first one we're covering. Uh, I mean, I, we, you don't, you never know. I never said there was a child killer. It sounded like a child killer. No, I, I never said and there was a child them killer. them too. I mean, that was just an introduction <laughs> I wrote. No, no, you don't, you don't know who's the killer, Ashwarya. We don't know who's the killer, We don't Aryan. know who's the killer. Take us there and tell us the story. It was the midnight of 23rd November, 1993. Dipankar Banerjee is a resident of Shubham Apartments in the Dum Dum region of Kolkata. Dipankar was half asleep counting sheep as he drifted off into his dreams. Except what he awoke to was worse than any nightmare his imagination could have conjured. Dipankar was inexplicably called to the fourth floor of the apartment by two residents. These two residents seemed alert and panicked. They demanded Dipankar's presence in a frenzy and worried Dipankar slipped into his shoes and rushed to the fourth floor of Shubham Apartments. When he reached there, he could hear something wailing, like a dog screeching when someone steps on its tail. On closer inspection, the source of the groans wasn't a stray animal, it was a human, a resident of one of the flats on the fourth floor of Shubham Apartments. This flat belonged to Subal Barui. It sounded like someone was crying for help from the inside, so Dipankar quickly called the Dum Dum police station and the cop showed up at the apartment. Upon arriving, the police broke into the door to the flat to find the scene of a grisly and chilling crime that shocked them to their very core. As they went from one room to the next in the flat, the sense of dread that enveloped them became deeper and deeper. Little did they know that as more details came out about what they witnessed in the Barui household, the sense of dread would envelop the entire city of Kolkata. As the police entered the flat, they saw Subal Barui's 16-year-old son, Sajjal Barui, tied to a chair with a rope next to the television set in the drawing room. He was alive. For a moment, Dipankar and the police were relieved. But that relief was momentary. As they proceeded to check in on the other members of the family, a solemn sight awaited them. In the adjoining room, Subal Barui's wife, Niyoti Barui, was tied to the back of a chair by a rope. Her hands were also tied and the head was lying tilted on one side, according to the court documents. She was covered in a bedsheet. Niyoti Barui was found dead. But the spate of these mysterious deaths was far from over. Like in a horror house, it was like going from one gory room to an even scarier one. The police entered the next room, wary and dreadful. There, they found Subal Barui himself lying dead on the floor with bleeding injuries and his legs tied with a rope. In the very same room, 
Subal's elder son Kajal Barui was also found lying dead again in a chair. Having set out to investigate noises coming from a random flat, the Kolkata police found themselves at the scene of a family side. Well, not exactly a family side though because there was one member alive, tied, gagged, groaning in pain. The situation was so bizarre and inexplicable that the police turned to Sajil for answers. They couldn't even begin to imagine his plight. Sajil had just witnessed his family's massacre and the authorities expected him to recount his tragedy. He told the police that his mother and him were watching television at around 7 p.m. the previous night when seven unknown men entered their flat, gagged him and tied him to the chair with rope. After that, they took his mother to another room where they tied her to the chair and killed her. As for his father and brother, they were outside at the time and he did not know what happened to them as he had fallen unconscious after hearing what took place from sajil the kolkata police began their investigation the investigation began with sajil being the prime victim but soon into the investigation the suspicions fell on him and he became the prime suspect You see Sajil was not able to give much detail about what happened on the day and he also did not show any major injuries or signs of struggle. Why would the killers murder the entire family but leave Sajil a witness to their crime alive and that too without any signs of injury? Upon interrogation Sajil told the police what really happened and the story that he told them was more dreadful than anyone could have ever imagined. The straight-faced perpetrator behind the triple murder in the Baroi household was none other than Sajil Baroi himself. It was Subal Baroi's 16-year-old son who was behind the gruesome murder of his entire family. The police listened in horror as Sajil, not even 17 years of age, confessed to killing his entire family in a matter-of-fact manner. On the night of 22nd November, Sajil had arrived at the flat along with five of his friends, all of them teenagers between the ages of 16 and 17. They had come prepared for what was to follow. This was not something that happened in the moment. Before arriving at Shubham apartment, they had purchased rubber gloves, lethal sharp cutting weapons, coconut rope, black cloth pieces and so much more to facilitate the actions that were to follow. Firstly, oh my god. Yeah. Secondly, that's a lot of planning for someone who was just going to go ahead and confess to their crime. Yeah. Was he like beaten up, kept in a cell, any of the regular usual police tactics we see in South Asia, or did he just straight up confess after all this planning? Like why tie himself to a chair? So so there are two sides to your question, right? One is the there was a lot of planning that went into it. Right. And I mean I can't even begin to enlist the planning. Uh, this took this was months into the planning. Oh wow. Yeah, so they went to get coconut rope because that was the best kind of rope, the strongest that could keep them. This was all thought oh. through. They went to the um sort of the ironsmith to uh, get the knives sharpened. they bought knives but they further sharpened them to ensure that the knives would be in perfect condition so the planning was impeccable mm-hmm. and it was well construed wow. it wasn't in the moment right. mind you these are 16 17 years old yes. year olds that are thinking deep about their murder as for whether he was tortured and what not n- none of that so why why confess after tying yourself up to a chair i think as the story will unfold Sajil's character will be more evident to you hmm. and I don't think he was a normal kid. The plan was set in motion. When Sajil and his friends arrived at the house, they found his mother watching TV alone. So, Sajil and his friends gagged her and tied her to a chair in the bedroom. A similar fate befell Sajil's brother Kajal and father Subal when they arrived home. Initially Sajil and his friend Ranjit tried to strangle all three family members to death but were only successful in killing the mother. Unfazed by the lack of success they proceeded to brutally hack Kajal and Subal with the very same knives they had just bought and just gotten sharpened. But not being seasoned criminals the entire series of events took nearly 3 hours. Now that they had committed the crime it was time for the cover up. or at least whatever they thought was a cover up 
On Sajil's instructions, they washed the weapons with mustard oil and water and burnt all the other incriminating evidence. If all this sounds bad, you will not believe what they did next. Having become exhausted as one does after all the maiming and killing and whatnot, they decided to take a well-deserved break. They took out some Bengali sweets from the fridge, had their fill, and then decided to leave behind a few coins as payment, you know, what? for whoever comes tomorrow to collect the money. That's wild. Yeah. And, you know, they took inspiration of this from an American serial killer who had, you know, actually paid for the ramen of one of his victims. So they killed the person, paid for the ramen, and this became sort of sensational that this murderer pays his dues. They learned from him and emulated the same, but with Bengali sweets. So I think now you understand Sajal's character A unfolding, bit, right? Yeah, like, yeah. this is, uh, this is not, this does, it's not a normal kid. No, this is not even an abused kid killing his parents. Exactly. Kind of and and, and, just... and we'll, we'll get to this. Because naturally, one would assume that to be the main motive. Right. That he was abused. I'm not sure about that. After pulling off the stunt that Sajil had viewed on television on a crime show, him and his company threw open the almiras and cupboards in the house and removed all the cash and jewellery to make it seem like a burglary gone wrong to mislead the police. As the finishing touch, the friends inflicted superfluous injuries on Sajil's person and tied him to a chair in the drawing room before leaving the flat and closing the door behind them. All right, Aran, I think we've clearly established this is not a normal trial. No. But also, the more abnormal a trial, the rarer they are. Yes. How did he manage to find a horde of other accomplices like yeah, him yeah. who just agreed to be a part of a plan like this? How does one even begin to ask such a thing of their friends? Ashwara, I think to answer this question, it's a rather cliche true crime tactic, but I think I'll need to delve into the past of Sajal and okay. who he was and how these friends actually came to be. Hmm. One would think that the true motive behind Sajil's actions could be retraced to his family. You see, Subal Barui's wife, Neoti Barui, was not Sajil's real mother. Before Sajil was born, Subal Barui had abandoned his first wife, Neoti, and their son, Kajal, and had taken up another woman named Minati. Sajil was an illegitimate child born out of this relationship for Subal had never divorced his first wife when he decided to be with Minati. After a few years, Sajil's parents separated and Subal started living again with his first wife, Neoti. Sajil's mother left him behind with his father and Sajil was eight years old at the time. Around this time, he started living with his father, his stepmother Neoti and his stepbrother Kajal. Sajil hatched up the entire plan in order to grab the entire property of his father. As for how he convinced five other teenagers to go along with his plan, the prosecution posited that he earned their sympathy by narrating imaginary instances of being subjected to inhuman torture by his father, by his stepmother and his stepbrother. The instances of torture narrated by Sajil included being burned with a hot iron and cigarette butts, having his head jammed inside the refrigerator by his stepmother and many other such indignities. If these instances are indeed true, then one can imagine how the combination of being left behind by his mother and the torture that he had to endure would have had a deep psychological impact on the 16-year-old. Perhaps that was the motivation behind Sajil doing what he did. Perhaps the prosecution was right and Sajil wanted to take over his father's property. A couple of points to the whole property and the motive angle, mm -hmm. Aran. I think, firstly, in the mind of a 16-year-old, yeah, thought... for property to be <laughs> yeah. the motive, at 16, you don't even know whether or not you, yeah. you know, in your mind, you might as well be getting all the property. Mm. It's such a non-thought. Yeah. To see that as the motive is a little bit hard for me. And what are you going to do as a 16-year-old with property? With the property, yeah, you right, get it. What, right, right. What no, you completely, do? Yeah. I, I just don't see it. But secondly, it seems like the way in which he killed his yes. parents, it just showed like a really, really deep-seated hatred, yeah. which is not usually the case when the matter is, you know, as, as frivolous as trivial as property. Yes. It doesn't harbor those deep-seated resentments. Unless you're much older, like for a 16-year-old. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't seem like that's the motive. Uh, I am inclined to agree with you, Ashwara. I think 
there was some deep seated hatred now whether that was born out of actual torture mm-hmm. or a figment of his abnormal mind mm-hmm. one can uh, argue either way the financial motive behind the crime like ishwara said makes no sense to me especially when you consider the fact that sajjal's father gave him plenty of money which he made use of frequently to watch movies eat in restaurants and grab a drink or two with his friends including the friends he asked for help for committing the crime but then again if sajjal's father was so generous in giving him money can we really take him at his word on the incidents of torture I'm not saying that it did not happen but I cannot seem to take it at face value. Who knows maybe it was a combination of both things. What is clear is that Sajjal did not belong to this family. Maybe he was mistreated by this family that led to resentment and hatred. Whatever it was, he decided to kill his family and take control of his father's property at the same time. Supposedly killing two birds with one stone. We do not know what truly made him do what he did. He was not even an adult at the time, which is going to be crucial to this case. I do not know how rationally he was weighing his actions and their consequences on his lives and the lives of those around him. Maybe he was just a psychopath, and there is no concrete reason behind his actions. I do not know. What I do know is that when Sajjal confessed to the crime, the Kolkata police arrested him and his friends, and they were put on trial before the additional sessions judge at the Barasar District Court. The trial court held that the crime fell within the rarest of rare categories and sentenced Sajjal to death by hanging for his role in the crime which was later reduced to life imprisonment. Throughout the entire trial Sajjal and his friends showed no signs of remorse. Even when the death sentence was announced they chose to clap and sing in unison. What? Yeah. Do you see what I meant by his character will unfold? I've right? seen a lot of those, you know, announcing of the verdict YouTube yeah. videos of reactions of some of the most notorious serial killers in the world. Yeah. I have never seen or heard of that reaction. If you're a 16-17 year old being told you're going to be killed for your actions and your response being uh ye zindagi mile i don't know what they were singing but they were That's singing at that wild the only sort of parallel i can think of is when bhagat singh and his the co were found guilty Yeah. and that is smile on their face vastly different vastly though. different but that's the only time it i guess makes sense but right. what are these 16 17 year olds thinking i'm also a firm believer in children don't turn out this way without having really really messed up families so i'm really curious I, to see I, if that is at all the case no like, i i don't i i'm not sure if i agree in this case i truly think psychopathy can be in some instances boiled down to genetics no but can't it be controlled based on the environment so if you do have a loving home yeah sure you're not killed and butchered and maimed by your child if you do love your child but i'm sure there are those instances where the household doesn't really matter um and, and this is one case where i think he i'm wagering i don't know for a fact that he had a neutral upbringing i'm not going to say he had the best parents not the worst parents either i think normal mm-hmm. bengali parents Mm-hmm. but this kid was in normal like i've said throughout the case mm. but this is not where the story stops as the viewers might have guessed from the fact that more than half the episode is still on their screens unplayed in fact the story becomes even more interesting slash confusing from here stajul and his friends are now in prison serving a sentence of life imprisonment a sad and somber situation for anyone well not for this gang of friends in fact the six youths surprised even the most hardened criminals with their show of merriment ecstasy and joy with a tinge of arrogance they appeared to have arrived on a long vacation to one of the finest holiday resorts in the world they spent their time singing and tapping their feet to the latest hindi film songs three of them were particularly fond of music from films and watched television every evening in the prison by all accounts instead of reflecting on their crimes and showing remorse sajul and his friends were having a blast in prison a couple of years on sajul's health took a turn for the worse and he was admitted to the chitaranjan national medical college for a problem with his kidneys it is from here that sajul staged an escape 
on 15th September 2001 despite the hospital grounds being full of police personnel escaping from a hospital swarming with police is impressive but the way he did it took the cake for me you see sajal would often ask his girlfriend to smuggle beer inside the hospital and drink it only with the guards on duty on the night of his escape Sajal decided to host a beer party and invited the two guards tasked with keeping him inside the hospital. I'm sure I heard you wrong. No. You did not say girlfriend. Girlfriend. The dude was listening to music, watching movies, was paying no rent in prison, so that was sorted and he had a girlfriend somehow. I don't know how. Uh that you don't know how that He's happened. really a when life gives you lemons kind of guy, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. What yeah. is going on? Yeah. I've always really deeply thought about those women that got really attracted to, you know, very famous criminals in jail yeah. and wrote them letters and mm-hmm. fell in love with them, promised to marry them when they got out. This is just Yeah. <laughs> So when I say they put together a beer party I simply mean sneakily drinking beer in the toilets with the guards nothing too fancy per se having become used to drinking with Sajal this party was nothing out of the ordinary for the guards only this time Sajal had laced the beer with sleeping pills after finishing his beer he returned to his bed and waited half an hour later he came out of his ward found the two guards sound asleep and casually walked out of the hospital the fact that sajil escaped right under their nose was a source of major embarrassment for the kolkata police they ran multiple raids to catch sajil again and again but to no avail sajil was nowhere to be found after fleeing from the hospital he fled to mumbai where he stayed for the next few months he met another girl there and got married to her in mid 2002 presumably after the honeymoon phase was over he sent his wife to asansol and decided to return back to you guessed it kolkata now one would imagine that on returning to kolkata from where he escaped prison sajal would keep low for a while live a low key life you know live quietly appreciate the little things in life take in the sunset and appreciate this undeserved freedom but sajal was just not like that as i said He was not normal. Instead, he took refuge with Hatkata Bishu, a local crime lord, and turned to robbery under the alias of Kamal. When the name Kamal propped up on the police's radar in connection with the dacoity, he again changed his alias and became Sheikh Raju. It was as Sheikh Raju that Sajil was once again taken into custody by the police for snatching and robbery in February 2003, close to 2 years after he had escaped from the hospital. But all hope was not lost for Sajil. After all, he was not Sajil. When he was arrested by the police again, they did not know that the person they had arrested was not a petty thief named Sheikh Raju, but actually a cold-blooded serial killer named Sajil. This time he was put in a different prison from before. For now, Sajil's alias was working. There was a chance that he could carry out his sentence as Sheikh Raju and then walk out of jail without anyone being the wiser of his real identity. Alas, his luck ran out and his good fortune came to an end. As I mentioned before, Sajil was not the most understated personality during his earlier stint in the prison. His friends and him were well known for their liking towards having a good time and enjoying themselves. They attracted attention to themselves and this attention had come back to bite Sajil. Even though Sajil had changed his hairstyle and adopted an entirely new look and was much older now, he was recognized by several of his fellow inmates. These inmates had been present with Sajil in the Alipur Central Jail where he had previously been serving his sentence for killing his family before he had escaped. In fact, one of these inmates named Pervez had come up to Sajil and threatened to expose his real identity unless he paid him 30,000 rupees as hush money. Sajil had promised to pay the amount as soon as he was free, but Pervez exposed him anyway. What a Samaritan. Sajil was also identified by the jailer in the new prison who recognized him from his earlier tenure. Having been recognized, Sajil was sent to the presidency jail and the alias Sheikh Raju died a quiet death. Sajil must have been a pain in the ass as a prisoner for the jailer for him to identify years later even though he had changed his appearance and identity. 
Having been identified though, Sajil was back to serving his life sentence for killing his family on top of the robbery. The freedom he had gained by escaping from the hospital did not last very long. The experience of finding himself incarcerated once again had a profound effect on Sajil and he committed to turning his life around for good. No, he didn't. No, he did not. This is not what happened. If you believe that bit about Sajil deciding to turn life around, you clearly have not understood this man. In the presidency jail, he formed a network with even more notorious criminals than the petty thieves in Kolkata. This network consisted of Aftab Ansari, the very criminal responsible for the 2002 terrorist attack on the American Centre in Kolkata. It also included Debashish Chakravarti, a criminal who killed his girlfriend as well as attempted to kill his mother. When this network was discovered by the authorities, they decided to break it up and Sajil was shifted to the Alipur Central Jail again. By now, Sajil had done an entire tour of the various prisons in Kolkata. Be it the Alipur Central Jail or the Presidency Jail or the Midnapore Central Jail or the Dum Dum Cantonment, he could probably make a career out of being a TripAdvisor reviewer of jails in Kolkata, comparing and contrasting which jail has the better food or a better cell or better toilets. Having already escaped from custody before, Sajil had to do something new this time to earn his freedom. Instead of staging another grand escape, he decided to take the legal recourse this time. You see, at the time that Sajil had been arrested, the Juvenile Justice Act only applied to those who were below 16 years of age. Sajil, being 16 years and 11 months old, was therefore tried and convicted as an adult and sentenced to death, which later became life imprisonment. In the year 2000, however, a new Juvenile Justice Act was enacted, which brought anyone below the age of 18 and not 16, like before, under its fold. But here's the kicker, under the act, no juvenile could be sentenced for more than three years or made to spend time at jail meant for adults. But most importantly, the new act would apply even to juveniles who committed their crimes before this law came into effect. Now, Ishwara, you are somebody who has studied law. You were actively preparing to go into law school. And this is something I remember you telling me about, that if a law is passed... Mm -hmm. It's really, I mean, I've never heard of a case where it's retroactively been applied. The whole point is that you can't just pass a law and then apply it previously because that just allows the government to pass laws for their convenience to get people um, incarcerated according to their will. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And that's a big, big loophole with this. But also theoretically and a little bit philosophically, any law that does come into place now is seen as the new standard for justice. And there's no reason why that new standard of justice shouldn't be applicable to every citizen Everybody. that has lived mm. and is still alive within a state, right? right? And so let's say that Sajal was really just a juvenile convicted when he was younger. Yeah. This new law comes into effect. He really should not be in jail anymore if he's below the age of 18. Since that is Since the that standard is of the justice. Standard now, and there is some logical validity to that standard. Right. Now that this legal remedy was available to him, Sajil decided to make use of it and approach the Calcutta High Court, alleging that his continued detention was illegal as he had already been in prison for much more than three years. The court agreed and ordered for Sajil to be released from prison on conditional bail. Finally, in August 2010, more than 15 years after Sajil was convicted of killing his family in cold blood, he walked out of the Alipur Central Jail as a free man. He was not a 16-year-old boy anymore, but a man in his 30s who had spent the majority of his adult life inside the four walls of a prison. Once inside his lawyer's car waiting outside, Sajil rolled down the window and told the reporters that he had started painting inside prison and he wished to hold an exhibition soon. Sajil had started taking painting lessons in jail by special arrangement and sold some of his paintings in state-organized exhibitions while inside prison. His works, including one that sold for 8,000 rupees, were displayed at the Birla Art Gallery in the Kolkata Book Fair. One critic wrote that Sajil's paintings, quote, startled by their obsession with brutish forms and their lurid colour schemes of black, red, yellows and oranges, somewhat similar to the gothic paintings by the Trenchcoat Mafia involved in the American school massacre, end quote. 
is this like that sect of art where they're over intellectualizing a person and by extension a piece that's just kind of a madman's ramblings with paint and canvas i think you are giving more credit to the critic than they deserve this oh. is just a critic that's like many art critics they want to seem cool right yeah yeah, yeah no definitely yeah you are unnecessarily intellectualizing 100% like what the hell yeah oh my god american gothic french go what the fuck dude no this was why are you unnecessarily getting deep about this yeah it's not that deep it's not that deep okay like it's uh, yeah it's just mm. uh, the art world i think the art world is a cr- you know crime of its own <laughs> splotch put a splotch and sell it for a million dollars <laughs> whatever that rambling by the critic meant um, it does give me the impression that the painting according to the critic was pretty good good enough for sajil to get in touch with an art exporter who deals in paintings and artifacts and enter into talks with him to begin a business venture by all accounts sajil's future was looking bright but as they say old habits die hard and once you've got a taste for something it is really difficult to stop Lo and behold a year after his release from prison Sajil was arrested yet again for the umpteenth time on a charge of theft he along with three other armed youth had looted around 1.3 lakh rupees eight cell phones and other valuables from a guest house in Jodhpur park by now you would know the drill after getting arrested he was convicted and then put in prison but he got out in 2017 but since 2017 there has been no news of him after being released from prison once again did sajil finally pursue his passion for painting and become an artist in his own right did he become a part of the criminal world once again as he had done so many times before or did he become a working man living an everyday life just like me and you perhaps he will be listening to this episode somewhere in the city of kolkata brimming with stories we have not yet uncovered in this picture we tried to piece together i guess we will never know but until then stay safe stay crazy and stay desi if you like what we do here at desi studios and absolutely love what we're wearing today this is merch you can go buy all for yourself you can buy this desi crime merch in our youtube store on the link down below at karat merch Keep the engines at Desi Studios rolling so we can pay our videographer right behind the camera to make these amazing episodes just for you.